Meet the Swinger. The Polaroid Swinger. It's more than a camera. It's almost alive. It's only $19.95. At least it was back in the early 60s when they introduced it. I picked this guy up off of Craigslist a few weeks ago. Um, and I figured I would do a video trying to run some film through it. Uh, I had two rolls. Um, one of them I ran through a few weeks ago when I got it. Um, everything was completely dry. After after doing so, I tore one of the pods apart and there was just a little bit of goo inside, but not much of anything. So, I figured do the second roll on video. Surprisingly though, um, even though the pods are dried up, print coater still has plenty of moisture left in it. So, um, on the swinger, it takes type 20 roll film, different from uh, the other roll film Polaroids because uh, when you pull on the film it develops outside the camera and then you peel it apart much like the uh, later pack film um, cameras rather than developing inside the camera where you peel it apart after opening a door. So, um, opening up the camera you got this little switch in the back and that unlocks it and it, it's also the pressure pad for the rollers. And we take our film here. If you don't know Polaroid film, it's basically a sandwich of a big roll which has the pods of developing agent and the positive receiving sheet which is basically paper coated with a gelatin emulsion with no silver in it and a roll of conventional like negatives. Um, when you take the picture it exposes the negative um, exposing silver halides then when you pull it, it pulls um, the two pieces of paper uh, on each of these rolls through set of rollers right here and right here they're pressed against each other that breaks the pod and spreads the uh, reagent the developing stuff through uh, that sandwich uh, that uh, developing reagent is mostly uh, well it's it's basically like a monobath monobath developer where you have um, a conventional developing agent uh, and a fixing agent mixed right into it. Uh, the practical upshot of this is that when you pull it through, the negative, which has been exposed, develops very quickly, and the unexposed silver halides in the negative become, or they, they go into a, the, the developing solution and diffuse into the positive layer, where they, uh, where they get developed after some time has passed. It only works because um, the uh, the negative layer develops very quickly. Uh, it's got a, well, comparatively to other films at the time, very short developing time and high ISO. Um, so yeah, that's the basic rundown of it. I'm getting onto a tangent here. Anyway, loading the camera, you have your negative side over here, this spool, and your positive side over here which is, it doesn't really need a spool because it doesn't need to be light tight. Peel it open, right there, and break the two reels apart. Do not break the seal. It doesn't really work because the adhesive is so far, or so dried out after how many years? January 1969, this stuff expired. Positive roll over here, negative roll over here. Close the camera back, like so, and just flip it down, it's spring-loaded. Then, um, take it in your left hand, you hold it like this, and there's this blue notch right here. You flip the tab open, pull the blue notch, or push it in, and grab the film at the same time, and just pull until it stops. And then you simply tear it right off. So, now we'll go take our first shot. Alrighty now, our first shot's been taken. Uh, before we start the development process, I want to talk about the uh, light meter slash exposure system for this camera. It's really, well, I've never 
heard of any other camera that has something like this. The light meter is right up here. Uh, when you squeeze the shutter button right here, it I don't know if you can see, but there's little slits that allow you that allows it to close in once you squeeze it. When it closes in, it pushes the shutter button up, and that triggers uh, a, an electrical switch inside that lights up a small incandescent bulb. The output in lumens of this bulb is known. Um, the exposure system then uses this known value of light compared with the incoming light from the light meter to show or to show in a grid, rather, um, when correct exposure is set. Uh, rotating this basically changes the filter in front of the light meter until those two sources of light match intensity. When they do match intensity, the little readout right down here, you probably can't see it, is uh, it, it says yes in, in, ch in like a red checkered box. Um, if it's slightly off that the, um, I don't want to say this, if the exposure is off, the checkers are darker or lighter than usual, and the yes is more difficult to uh, make out and read. So whenever the yes is clearest in the exposure window, you know that you have correct exposure. All right, moving on now. Uh, just like when we tore off the film meter before, we press this in, the blue button, you hear that little click. Um, when you pull the film each time, it, uh, it locks up on a piece of thicker paper. There's a little tab that drops into it as it slides along. And when that tab falls into that hole, it uh, pulls a switch and uh, disallows you from pulling it any further. There's a, a little mechanical stop. And then when you press on this blue button here, it releases that mechanical stop so that you can pull it out further. So, pull it straight out, like so. Oh dear. We got a problem. Um, this is the positive receiving sheet here. It looks like the negative layer... Did you even come out of here? Oh, it must have broke off maybe. Anyway, the negative layer didn't come out with the positive layer. Uh, normally you shouldn't do this, but I kind of got a problem here. Negative layer is sitting right here. It's just negative film on a black base, like the backing paper of medium format film. Slide that back in there and pull it out a little. Because it's so old, the adhesive must have just, well, broken off because it just didn't have the strength to pull back on. Yeah. All right. Tear that off. First exposure was done anyway. There's no reagent on here. Um, yeah, pods were dry. You can see right here, these are the little tabs that the pin drops into the locking mechanism for uh, advancing the film. If this were a, uh, if this were successful in breaking the pod, uh, you'd peel it apart just like a uh, pack film. There's a little tab right here that you can break off, and it just peels away from the sheet, and then you break off that holder thing there. Second exposure, um, let's try it with flash. When I got this film, there was also a few AG1 flash bulbs with it. Um, this camera, by the way, just takes uh, standard AA batteries. So we, um, right here, there, there's the flash gun right there. There's just a little switch right here. Uh, when you push the bulb in, it pushes this lever here down, and then to eject the bulb, you just push it up, and it springs out. So. Press the ball in, like so. Let's take a picture of Walter. Walter's our dog. He We just got him a couple of weeks ago. He's a four-month-old puppy. And he is uh, three feet away. What's nice about this camera 
unlike the later pack, ooh, that bulb stinks. Um, what's nice about this camera, unlike later pack film cameras, is that it doesn't have an electric exposure system, uh, the so-called electric eye. Um, because of uh, the electric eye in later pack film cameras, the shutter speed is often increased because uh, you don't really control the aperture. This one, the exposure meter, just simply controls aperture. The electric eye controls um, shutter speed. So this makes it much better for uh, snapshot pictures rather than, I don't know, whatever else you would take. Um, not that you can't use like flash with other pack film cameras, but yeah. Second exposure, push the tab in, grab both layers of the film this time, I think. Yeah, black, black layers on the bottom. And just pull. Oop. Not far enough that time. Let's try again. It just popped into the locking tap spot. There we go. Tear it off. Pods are dry again. Anyway, this is what it would have looked like had the pods come out together. After proper development time, just take it and peel it off like that in one swift motion. Ooh. Oh, look at that. Just a little tiny little bit of developer right there. Nothing really useful, but you can see it on the paper here too, just on the edges. If I can, no, I can't really peel apart with my fingernails, but these pods are uh, just metal foil covered in paper on the top and bottom side, and they're taped on there. Swinger film or, well, any roll film really, would like to be the easiest kind of Polaroid film to recreate in the modern day. When the Impossible Project was doing uh, their revival of integral film about eight years ago, they had a much harder time. Even though they had the manufacturing equipment, they still had to make all new chemistry. This you can basically use any black and white chemistry with, um, well, with slight modifications, but you get the point. The pack film, which I'm really hoping they're going to do a good job, or, well, be able to revive it in the future, um, they're going to have a, not the easiest time either. Pack film is much, or is very similar to swinger film. Although it uh, it's got a much more difficult to manufacture, um, uh, well, how do I say carrier? Because you have to manufacture the packs as well, rather than just the raw the raw film stock and rolls. Rolls you can actually um, 3D model and 3D print. I've I have the 3D models that I made for, oh shoot, I didn't even expose that one. Oh well, it's not even, yeah. Anyway, the, uh, uh, I have 3D modeled the rolls for both uh, 30 series and 40 series roll film. So they, well, they're very easy to manufacture, even uh, not 3D printing it, but seems as if all of these are dry, unfortunately. This was exposure four of eight, I believe. I think there's eight in a the pack. There were eight in a pack for both 30 and 40 series film. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, for, uh, well, for 40 series at least, there is no color 30 series film, except for one exception. Um, they had six exposures per pack, which is slightly different. That was because of the uh, greater thickness of the film, because you have to have three emulsion layers for each of the three colors of light in order to have a three-color film. Exposure five, also dry. Mm, 
just a little tiny bit of reagent leaking out right there. I'm just taking these dust shots out, um, out my back door here, into our backyard. It's nice and bright. I'm kind of surprised they never, or Polaroid never came out with a cold clip for the swinger, much like they did for the uh, regular pack film cameras. That squeaking is Walter over there. He's playing with his chew toys. Um, for those of you that don't know, the cold clip was used to uh, heat up the film as it was undergoing development in cold temperatures. Because uh, development times and temperatures with Polaroid film is so much more critical, um, well, it's black and white film developing in a minute or less normally uh, compared to I don't know. I normally develop 35 millimeter black and white at 10 minutes. Um, temperature has to be much more accurate. Um, that was seven, I believe. So what they did was they had this metal um, kind of folding tabs that you would warm up under like an armpit or under a coat, and then you would stick the film sandwich in there as it was developing, and then. Uh, pull it out when it was ready to uh, be peeled apart. Last one right there. This is the extra liter of the negative because we didn't pull any out with the first exposure. And then the positive side right here just extends a little bit past there. On the positive side here you can see it's made up of, well, like suppose you could say two and a half layers. You got the regular like um, print paper that has a gel, well just plain gel, it's a no emulsion in it spread on top of it so that it can receive silver halides um, when reagent is spread through it. And then you've got the pods right here that are just taped on and the tab holes right here for stopping at each exposure. And then these are just um, I suppose you could call them like balancing strips, like on motion picture film, how they had, um, uh, what do you say, magnetic soundtracks, and then on the opposite side they had a balancing track. I'm, I'm believing that's what these are. But yeah. So unfortunately there's, there was none of these that provided usable pictures. You know, let me tear a tab off and let's see if I can break it apart really quick. I've got big stubby fingernails. I can't. Anyway, you can see here, um, it's just metal foil. On the top here, it's been folded over. Um, on the sides, it's crimped. And then on the front half, it's not um, sealed really, but it's pressed very tightly so that it's seals in a way so that when it comes through the rollers like this it pushes it out but not to the sides and not back that way towards the rollers and that way it keeps the uh, reagent from getting all over the rollers and gumming them up and stuff like that inside the camera then you can see that right there see if you can see it. That little tab right there on the end of the roller is what slots into the the part on the film that um, marks each exposure. So if you push that, like um, the film has tripped it, and then press in on the blue button, it allows it to spin. Like that. And then on the other side here we just have our empty spool. Like I said before, it takes standard AA batteries in their own battery holder. Um, batteries power both the light meter, that little bulb inside, and they power the flash gun, which takes little midget bulbs, AG1 bulbs, like so. Same kind of bulbs that are inside of 
splash cubes. Anyway, um, yeah, that's that. This here, print coder, I should probably talk about that. Um, still trying to figure out the chemistry behind it, but as far as I know, it acts like a sort of um, sort of lacquer for the exposed prints because this is um, it's just gelatin on paper. Um, it scratches very easily. Um, it also acts as a protection against the oxygen environment in the air so that the silver, once it's developed onto here into a positive print, doesn't oxidize. Um, and turn weird colors and stuff or start to fade. Um, back in the day, I believe it even says in the instructions here, Polaroid said to simply draw it over the corner of a table, flatten it out, take your print coater right here, and just kind of stroke it across. And I've only done half of this print here, but you can see well, I don't know if you can really see on the camera, but there's a line right about there. This half has not been coated. This half has been. Um, it's got a very specific look, like somebody has taken a paintbrush and painted right over it. When this dries, though, I have some other prints. Not that they don't have any um, silver on them, but um, the coated side... Oh, it's already dry, actually. Um, the coated side has a much... Um, how shall I say, seemingly resistant to the environment coating rather than just the gelatin. Um, don't know why they don't have coaters for color film or how they solved the problem. I think in 1971 they introduced black and white coaterless film, but the two chemistry problems with film that Walter the two chemistry problems that I'm trying to solve right now with analog film are the the couplers for Kodachrome film and Polaroid print coder but that's for another day